providers and expert teachers. Lynn is there at the top of the crop. So today our topic is diction. So I know, as I said, we're running just a few minutes behind, so I'm not going to take any more of Lynn's time. But I do want to give one caveat. As we are presenting tonight, we would love to be able to answer any of your questions. So uh, if you do have a question, just click on the little chat bubble and place your question in there. And then we'll be uh, trying to answer those as we proceed. So Lynn, it is all yours. Okay, great. Hello, everybody. This is our second webinar for the year. It's here it is June and we're now looking at a new technical writing certificate program that's starting up in July. So this is a perfect time to segue into a new career if that's what you're looking at. Because I will tell you this right now, technical writers are in demand. And so I wanted to start with a review for today's webinar, not just to jump right into diction, but to explain the role diction plays and how a problem in diction could diction, I'm sorry, could also create a problem in grammar or even spelling. So that one mistake is like a weed. It could have three consequences to it. So if you'll go to your packet that I made up for you today, I said, you know, introduction to the webinar. I want to start with a review of what I call the technical writing trifecta. And what I'm saying is that to be an efficient communicator, you have to know three things to start. And the first one is what is your role? You have a role as a technical communicator. What is your goal? How do you fulfill that goal? And third, what is your challenge? So I'm just going to give you about a minute to jot down your answer for that, your role. And the best way to fulfill that goal is to what? And the challenge. When I teach these courses, I'm always emphasizing your role as a writer. So if you take nothing away from today's session, except for this one thing, that you have a role that you must fulfill on, then this is it. This is the one thing you want to take with you. So your role as a technical writer or speaker or communicator is to establish common ground with your intended audience. There it is. You're establishing common ground. A lot of times there's, there's very little common ground, so you have to really work at generating that. Sometimes you have complete common ground. But the fact is, is that you know what the needs of your readers are. See, they're not going to read something if they don't have an intention to have those needs satisfied. That's where your role comes in. Then the second part, the best way to, to, to fulfill that goal is... And, and if you want to post your answers to the chat page, that'd be great. So I can, you know, answer to some of the, the learners what, what you think. So your goal is to make any communication valuable to the learner. That's what your goal is, is to make it valuable to them. You know, you want to make sure that they, those needs are satisfied. And then the last one, the challenge is real simple to say the most and the least. You know, you're always looking to see where you can shave off anything that does not fit. And that's where today's session on, on diction is going to come into play. So your role is to establish common ground with the intended audience. You fulfill that, that goal or that purpose by making any document useful to the reader and your challenge is to say the most and the least. So next, let's review, and it's been a while since we've talked about this, but the nine principles of technical writing. This is something that I've, I came up with years ago, and I've added to it throughout the years, because I see that there are these, you know, very potent and durable principles of technical writing. And I use this analogy, so you can see I have glasses for reading. And a lot of people have glasses nearsighted, farsighted. But when you want your, your vision corrected, you ask the, the ophthalmologist to put a prescription in to do that. Well, pretend like 
those nine principles are your prescription for effective professional communication. So it's like you have a pair of glasses and when you read somebody else's document, let's say you're editing something, here's what you're reading from, those nine principles. They are either there, and if they are, are they there accurately, precisely, or they're not there, they're missing. And you would tell somebody, you need to add this to your writing. So the nine principles, appropriateness, and we're not going to go into detail on them. I'm just going to cover the general rule. Focus and unity. Development, how you develop your ideas with hard and soft evidence. Organization, how do you logically frame your ideas? Sentence structure. Fluency. Style including rhetorical devices and literary devices, diction and mechanics. So the last webinar that we had was on mechanics. So we're starting at the bottom and then moving up. But if you look at this, this is the mechanics. There's your foundation and diction because it works in tandem with mechanics, spelling, grammar. It's always nestled right there next to mechanics, diction. So those are the nine principles, and we're going to be focusing on diction, but you're going to see how sentence structure, what else, style, mechanics, how they're all affected as well by diction. So the next thing, Roman numeral four, types of errors in diction. Let me move this up a bit. I, your copy should be just like mine. So I wanted to go over some of the basic types of diction errors because it's not like this one size fits all. Diction comes in a variety of problems. And the first one that we're gonna look at, and I'm just gonna give a very cursory definition of each one of these. And just to remind you, this is a two part series. So we will cover even more types of errors next time and work on some editing and some common problems. So this is, this is a two-parter because it's such a full, full discussion and I don't want to shortchange it. So we, we have it in two weeks, we come back and I'm going to add more to it and review. So syntax diction. So let me just explain. So diction by itself is nothing more than word choices. That's all diction is. It's the right word in the right context. You know, you never know what a word means until it resides with other words. It's kind of like in a force, you know, it has to reside with others to know, oh, what word are you using? I'll, I'll give an example. So, uh, and I don't have my pen here. I'm, give me just a second find where I put my pen because I'm going to give you a word that I want you to define. Well, I can't find it. I am so sorry. I came with, without a pen. So I, I don't want to say the word because that's going to give away the activity. But write these letters down on a piece of paper. D-O-E-S. D-O-E-S. Now, turn that word into a sentence. Add some in the beginning, in the middle, in the end. I don't care where. Just turn that word, D-O-E-S, into a sentence. And I give you a few, few seconds to think of a great example. So I'm going to say that most of you would have considered D-O-E-S as a verb. Like she does the following report. She does, let me see, come up with a better one. She does great work. 
or as a question, does he live on the corner? But what if I said that's not what DOES is? What if I said, here's the sentence, the two does ran into the forest, spelled the same way, but one is a noun, one is a verb, but you don't know what role that word is playing until you put it with other words. It resides in other words. That's diction. Diction is, you know, what word is the right word for the context of the other words? Syntax, however, in syntactical diction problems is the arrangement of those words. You know, how do you arrange your words? English has a basic sentence logic structure. The basic structure for our English is we start a sentence with the subject, we move into the predicate, and then we put our, our objects or complements at the end. That is our basic syntax. Anything that changed that would affect the diction. So if you look at diction as word choices, syntax is the arrangement of those words. Next, colloquial. So there are diction problems that are considered colloquial or they're native to a certain area. When we talk about colloquial language, you know, here in Texas, y'all, that would be a colloquial diction example. Y'all or ain't. See, it's not grammatically correct, but it's colloquial because it's accepted. Next, confused diction. This is the one that, that I hear as problems all the time. Confused diction. Can anybody think of an example of confused diction where you're just you're use, using the wrong word altogether? So I'll give you an example. My cable went out yesterday and I called in to the company and I get a recording and it says something like this, you know, that, oh, um, are you having issues with your internet or your cable? And I'm not having issues, even though that's what the recording says. And that's what the people said to me when I got a real life person. I'm having a problem. I have a real problem. I don't have an issue. But we've changed that because somewhere along the line, people thought, oh, problem is too negative. It has this negative tone and connotation to it. Not really, if you think about how we use it, but this would be confused diction when we're saying something like issue for problem, use for utilize. That's another uh, example of confused diction where people we in incorrectly use, utilize. And I'll, I've got that in your list of 22 common errors. We'll talk about that one in more detail. So confused diction, probably the most problematic area of all the different types of, of diction. Deadwood. So if you've ever watched a, a HSN or QVC on television, those are shopping stations. And they just love to tell you about this brand new item. This is brand new. Well, that's an example of deadwood diction because you don't need the brand in front of the new. New is new. It doesn't need brand. How about end result? I, I hear electricians and IT people talk about the end result. Mm -mm. No, that would be a deadwood example because it's not, it, you don't need the end in front of result. You just need end or result, but not both. You need new, not brand new. Next, verb usage. Oh, there are so many different problems with diction and verb usage. Let me give you the, 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 best, the best way to increase your reputation is to make sure that in the subjunctive case, you use the correct verb. V verbs come in mood. We have four different moods. In the subjunctive cases, this anything that's contrary to fact, like, you know, if I were a rich man, that was a song popular in the 60s, if I were, see, it's contrary to fact, or, you know, any, any use of that 
needs the verb were instead of the verb was. If John was working on his MBA, he could be hired for the position. Now, that sounds perfectly appropriate, but it's not applying the subjunctive diction use of were. I would have to change that for if John were working on his MBA. That is a hard, fast rule that I don't see changing, unlike other rules that are changing very quickly. And we'll talk more about that. But the subjunctive case is a sign of your professionalism. So if you're using the if conditional, you always want to follow through structurally with the verb were. There are other verb choices too. We'll talk about those later or this week. Pronoun usage. So I'll give you an anecdote. I was tutoring a young boy in the ninth grade and uh, my phone rang and I asked him if I could get it. And this is all he heard. This is she. Can I call you back later? And I hung up and he said, Miss Lynn, my mom pays you really good money to tutor me and teach me the right way to use English. And I can't believe you made that mistake. And I said, what mistake? And he said, you said, this is she instead of this is her. And I said, I did say that, didn't I? And he said, but now that I think about it, you wouldn't give me the wrong use. <laughs> I said, you're right. I wouldn't give you the wrong use. That is correct. This is she. And he said, but why does it sound so bad? And I said, because we were, we're relying on sound instead of rules. And here's the rule. If I finished my sentence, it would sound like this. And then it would make sense. This is she speaking. Now my diction is correct. But it was correct before with just this is she. But it makes sense to the other listener when I added the verb speaking and finished out the sentence. So depending on your pronoun usage, you could create a diction error. Okay. Um, still sounds wrong. Well, when I say this is she speaking, okay, let, let me test the waters. This is her speaking. Does that sound better? See, in my world, it doesn't. But we're talking here about professional diction, folks. We're not talking about conversational English with your friends or what you watch on TV. We're talking about the kind of communication skills that earns you promotions. So in that case, you'd want to say, my brother is older than I, not my brother is older than me. That's how most people talk. That's a blatant error in diction. My brother is older than I am because the am gets truncated and cut off. So that's how you know, you know, if you can add that verb afterwards, you know, you've got the right use. Okay, preposition usage or lack of preposition. One of my biggest pet peeves is when people talk about how they graduated and they don't say from a university. There's a, there's a movie called Annie Hall, came out in 1978, and there's a line in it that he graduated Harvard. And it's like, oh my gosh, that just sounds awful. How can you graduate Harvard? You need that, that preposition, which gives the location and gives the, the structuring of the sentence. I graduated from college, not I graduated college. Folks, don't use that ever again. Really, you, you want to, it, it, on a dime, improve your credibility? Always make sure you have the right preposition. For example, this is different than, this car is different than my last car. That's a very common expression, but the diction is wrong because it's not different than, it's different from. My new car is different from my old car. Not a than, it's a from. Next one, structure, structure. So the most common, and it's in the packet, but we'll, we'll go on and discuss it now. St structure has weight to the balance of your words. And one of the best ways to make balance to your advantage, add balance and harmony to your writing is if 
if you're writing the not only, but also sentence structure, you have all four words in there. Not only am I tired, but I am also hungry. And I stress this because a new rule is out to obliterate the also. People are just saying not only, but. And I'm seeing professional writers even leave out the also. For whatever reason, just to streamline it and make your writing more concise, I guess. But I would not accept that change in rule. As your professional instructor, I would tell you, you want to make sure that if you're going to start with the not only, you finish off with the but also. This is a rule of diction. It's a rule of sentence structure. And it's also a word of style because there's a style that goes in with it when you hear not only, but also. It completes the weight. The balance of the weight is now very lovely. And, and, when you're reading something, you want it to sound, even a technical document, an engineering document, there's a need for it to sound, you know, elegant, lovely, you know, good on your ears. So there you are. Those are the types of errors that we're going to discuss today. We'll have uh, some more to add next time. But let's go to your worksheet that I typed up for today. And let me just check on, we're right at the halfway mark. Let me see if there are any questions here. Somebody said it still sounds wrong. I think it's the she speaking was the reference to that. Does the buck like to chase does? Yes, yes, he does. Okay, a little play on words from Matt. Thank you. Yes, nice examples. Okay. Here's your worksheet. And what I have here are 22 errors to avoid. And then at the end, there's a little minor editing for diction activity. So the first one, the difference between a lot and lots of temp. Avoid using a lot or lots as a modifier. Temp, avoid lots when it's used as slang. So I'm only talking professional writing. Correct. Jane likes her job a lot. Correct. Jane likes her job, which is just more professional. You don't need the a lot. Two, among and between. So this is a rule that is also changing. More and more writers, professional writers, are using between for any number. But we grew up on the rule that you use the preposition between for two items and among for three or more. And that was just a hard, fast rule. <clears throat> among involves more than two. Between involves only two. <clears throat> this rule has been waning over the last few years. Many professional writers are now using between for any number. Incorrect. The discussions between our group members were often lively. The discussions among our group members were often lively. That would be a better, better way to write it. Three, around or about. This is a good rule. I don't, I don't know too many people who actually know this rule and use it, so I thought it'd be a great opportunity to add this to your mental toolbox. Don't use around to indicate time, distance, or any other quantity. Incorrect. The class usually begins around nine, and that's what I hear people say, around nine. But the correct Diction is the class usually begins about nine. Number four. Here's another set of words that I don't hear used accurately very often. Based off or based on. So here's your tip. Here's your rule. Don't use off after based. Based off of all that info we can move ahead. And if you go back and look at memos from other people you work with, you'll probably find that's the use instead of based on. You just don't need that extra preposition. Based on that info, we can move ahead. So in that case, it's a prepositional diction problem. So what should you do to improve your grammar? 
learn preposition usage because I'll tell you right now, prepositions are so tricky and they're so slippery. They're like water, you know, you, you put them in, in, in on the stove and it'll start to bubble and they'll evaporate. You put them in the freezer, they'll turn hard and, you know, it, it's still, it's still water. It just changes the composition. Same thing with prepositions. You really want to know the composition of prepositions. Next one, number five because. Don't use because after reason. I was teaching to a um, billion dollar corporation in Dallas. Uh, the vice president hired me to put together a, a six month technical writing certificate program for his team of professionals. And when I got to this lesson right here about the because and reason, they don't go together. They're like oil and water. They do not go together in a sentence. And all of them were so surprised. And even the vice president, he said, I have never learned that lesson. I've never had anybody tell me this. We've used this in our reports. We've talked about, you know, because of da, 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 the reason. And he said, you were worth the whole program just from this one ruling. So here's your incorrect version. The reason for our flight delay was because of bad weather. You get one or the others, folks. You get a reason or you get a because. You don't get both. The reason for our flight was bad weather. See how nice and tight that is? It has no dead wood, no verbiage, no illogical side use of words to it. Mm -mm. Very clean. The reason for our flight delay was bad weather. There it is. No, it was because. And I've heard some people, they like to add why in there too. Like the reason for our, our flight delay was because of bad weather, which is why I'm late. Something like that. They'll even add a why to it. Six, in and into. In means within or inside, while into refers to the motion of going from outside to inside. Bill went in the bus station to buy a ticket. No, Bill went into the bus station to buy a ticket. Good rule with prepositions again. Seven, infer and imply. To infer is an act of thinking. To imply is an act of saying something. So that's just kind of a, a short version of that. So here's my additional tip. When you imply something, you encode it. So you add to it. Whereas when you're inferring, then you're, you're decoding. You know, that's that, the process of thinking. Incorrect. I saw your email about a noon meeting. Meeting. Are you inferring that we should have lunch together? See, there's not, nothing being inferred except from the person who's speaking. That should be, I saw your email about a new meeting. Are you implying that we should have lunch together? Because that's what I inferred. So I added that piece to it to show the process. Eight. Less than, fewer than. Oh, I hear this in this, these two usages with nouns used incorrectly quite frequently. And not just with people, but in commercials. So I added a commercial here. And there was another one that I just saw in print. So here, tip, use less than only with uncountable or mass items. And few or fewer than with countable nouns. Excuse me, hold on just a second. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that, that was Bill. He brought me a pen. <laughs> Good, because I'm going to give you another exercise like that. Okay, back to this less and fewer. Use less than only with uncountable or mass items and few or fewer with countable or plural nouns. Incorrect. 
there are less people in the store today than yesterday. Incorrect. And this is the commercial for Trop 40 orange juice. Trop 50, I mean Trop 50. Trop 50 orange juice has 50% less calories. First time I heard that, er, it was like nails on a chalkboard. It was like, are you kidding me? They just paid this advertising company, you know, $5 million to come up with this great advertisement. And this is what they got. This It's not only grammatically incorrect, but there's another error with this one as well. So it would read, Trump 50 orange juice has 50% fewer calories because they're countable. The calories are countable. Or the people, there are fewer people in the store than yesterday. So you can count the people. So the other problem with this Trop 50 commercial, Trop 50 orange juice has 50% fewer calories. It's got a, a misplaced modifier or dangling modifier because we don't know then what. The comparison is not complete. It has 50% fewer calories than what? Before, then the competition, then who, then another brand name. So a lot of times, and I said this in the beginning, a single problem in diction is going to cause other problems like spelling or grammar, or in this case, modification. The modification is incorrect. But here's the good news. Enough people must have called in or written into Top 50 because they changed it. They actually changed both. They changed it correctly to 50% with the uh, fewer. And they also added the, the complete modifier to it. So they did not want to be dogged by bad grammar. And um, if you take my technical writing certificate program, when we have the editing class, which the editing class is a standalone class if you're interested, I would highly suggest that you come. It's just two Saturdays, two full Saturdays on, on a weekend. And it, what you're going to take with you is unmatched anywhere else. And one of the one of the lectures that we have in that class is on what's called unconventional grammar. There's this new trend for this new kind of writing style called unconventional grammar, where companies know that they are creating a grammatical error, but it's intentional. And we go into examples of that and the reasoning and how it came into existence and what the, what the result is, what, why advertising companies are encouraging this. Okay, so that was the less than, fewer than rule. Good rule to have. Next page. Oh, okay, here's another example that I gave up at the top. Correct. After my vacation in Las Vegas, I have less money and got fewer hours of sleep. So it's not a real highly effective grammatical sentence, but at least it's got the less and the fewer in the right placement so that your diction is correct. After my vacation to Las Vegas, I have less money. See, if you wanted to talk about it in terms of dollars, you'd have to say fewer dollars and got fewer hours of sleep. Okay, like and as. See, like and as, is it going to be as a preposition? Is it going to be as a conjunction? You Back again, you have to know the context of the sentence. Tip, use as when comparing actions and use like when comparing things. So this is a real simple way to remember how to use like and as. Incorrect. Mary wants to re write a report just like Jane does. Or this commercial that came out in the 1960s. I was a kid. I still remember this. Winston tastes good like a cigarette should. This is a great example of, yes, that unconventional grammar. Because the makers of this, this little tagline for Winston cigarettes. They did it intentionally. 
they knew that it should be Winston tastes good as a cigarette should. But by making it grammatically incorrect, look at all the free advertising they got from people talking about it. <laughs> That's part of unconventional grammar. Uh, so, so correct. Mary wants to write a report just as Jane does. There you go. So like and as. Number 10, on account of or due to or because. Use because instead of on account or due to. And that's just a good rule of causality. Incorrect. On account of the weather, our plane was delayed. Or due to bad weather, our plane was delayed. That should be delayed. Or because of the bad weather, our plane was delayed. Yes, yeah, so strong riders don't use due to because it's not real clear. Because is the only word with the, you know, of those three choices that shows the causal relationship. You wouldn't even want to use sense because sense is used more for location. Because is your best choice for establishing the logic of causality. Next, problem issue. Tip, a problem is in need of a major solution. In addition, use problem when referring to an inanimate item or object. Incorrect. I hear you've been having issues with your internet service. That's uh, the commercial, what is the name of that, uh, that company, uh, internet company, Spectrum. That's, I took that straight from their commercial. It should be, I hear you've been having problems with your internet service, not having issues. You have an issue with an inanimate object. Logically, it makes no sense, but this is such a common dictionary. It's become part of, of our yeah, colloquialisms. Next, incorrect. My internet had issues. So if somebody said that to me, I'd say, when did your internet learn how to talk to tell you that? Because that's how that's implied, that my internet had issues, that it's this live entity, this organic live thing, and it told you that it had these issues. Or my car had brake problems. You know, to say that as it's written, my car had brake problems, it implies that the, that the car was doing the talking to you about the brake problems. Next one, use and utilize. Number 12, prefer use under any circumstances. Use as a verb meaning utility, whereas the verb utilize refers to using something in an unfamiliar way. This is a rule right here that most people not only don't know, but they also don't use. You can utilize my laptop. May I utilize your phone? No, those two are incorrect. The correct way would be, may I use your phone or you can use my laptop. Here's the only way to use utilize correctly. The window latch is broken, but we can utilize a fork to hold it up. So utilize as a verb is used in, when you're showing a non-traditional, unfamiliar way of use. Most people don't know that rule. See, aren't you fortunate you decided to come here today on a Friday afternoon? You've got all these little, little known rules. 13, affect, impact, and affect. Don't confuse them. Each can be used as a noun or a verb. Don't use impact when you mean the result, as in the effect. Avoid using impact as a verb in place of effect or as a noun in place of effect. Effect as a verb means to influence, while impact as a verb means to strike with a blow or to pack firmly together. Incorrect. Downed power lines impacted local consumers. Customers. No, that would... That's incorrect. You'd want to say downed power lines affected local customers. Snuck and sneak. 
So if any of you know, um, there's a, a journalist who used to have a show called The O'Reilly Factor. His name was Bill O'Reilly, and he was a high school teacher of English as well. And he was talking about snuck, somebody snuck out. And I wrote him an email in my tagline. The subject line was, <laughs> it's kind of rude of me now that I think about it. And to think you were an English teacher. I didn't hear back from him, but I explained to him that when we conjugate verbs, in particular the verb sneak, the past tense ain't snuck, it's sneaked. Now, some of you are going to say, that just sounds awful. I know, I've had my college students have just ridiculed me. Professor, that sounds so awful when you say sneaked. It's not right. Well, guess what? It's right. And if you let... If you let sound be your guide, your reputation is going to drop. Next. So the correct was the prisoner sneak out of jail. To and and. Tip. Infinitive verbs need the to and not and. Will you try and get the report to me today? No, it should be, will you try to get the report to me today? Better would be, will you submit the report to me today by 5 p.m.? 16, did or did, uh, done or did or complete or finish. Meet is done, actions are completed, whereas business-related actions are not done, but rather completed or finished. The fiscal report is done, incorrect. We did the report, incorrect. The fiscal report is complete or we conducted the report. That is a much more professional way to write it. There's a commercial about drive safe. I think it's Chevy or GM. Next time you see it on, on television, you'll remember what I'm about to say. Adverbs modify verbs and need the L-Y ending. It's not drive safe, it's drive safely. 18, compliment or compliment. Compliment is a verb while compliment is a noun. And this is what I tell people. I say, only I can give or receive a compliment. See, now, now you realize, oh yeah, it's, it's a noun. To compliment your kitchen. And this was on a tag on a hand towel from Walmart. To compliment your kitchen. No, what they meant was to compliment as in the verb, as in to make arranged completely. 19, not only, but also, we've already talked about that. Yeah, so here's an example of an incorrect. A college degree is not only necessary to make money, but it will pay for itself over time. The correct way would be to say, a college degree is not only necessary to make money, but it will also pay for itself over time. And here's what I ask you to do. Do you hear the structural balance that complete usage brings to the communication? Do you hear that? Not only, but also. 20, of and have. Tip, use a verb rather than a preposition in this case. Though most professionals don't commit this written sin, some speakers use the wrong word in spoken English. They would say something like, Mary should have edited her report before submitting it to the team. But it has to be the verb, Mary should have edited. Yeah, there was a commercial, I think it was um, V8. It's a uh, tomato juice drink. And a while back, they used to say, should have. Should have had a V8. Should have had a V8 instead of should have had a V8. Next one. We have two left on this page and then a short little editing activity. While and although or though. And this is a little known rule. Most people don't know it, so most people can't use it. Tip. A common misuse of diction is to use while for although, which means contrary to fact. You know, don't use while when you mean though and want to show opposition. While the company needs a new computer system, we won't purchase it. The correct way should be although the company needs a new computer system, we won't purchase it.
See, it's in spite of this. So if something's in spite of that, then you need the although. While is more about distance and time while on vacation. But I see more and more people opting for while instead of although. Last one, whose or whose. One is possessive case. The other is a contraction of who is. Who's taking a lunch break? No, oh, it should be who is or who's. Correct. Who's taking a lunch break? You need the contraction. Whose car alarm is going off? No, it's the possessive. And that's it. Look at that typo. That should be a car, not a care. Whose car alarm is going off? So strike that E off there. There you go. So let's see. Let me put this together. Here is a little editing activity. It should be together like that. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to see how many diction errors you can find in this handout. And this handout was located at a college where I taught many years ago. And it said this, if the copy machine is experiencing issues, please utilize the one on the second floor. Don't try and fix it yourself. I think it is wise to let the repairman fix it. But if you know the reason why it's having an issue, let me please let me know. So I'll give you a couple of minutes. If you want to post any questions to me on the chat, this would be a good time to do that. Shane, are you still there? I am, Lynn. Did you get a copy of this to, to edit, Shane? Did you get a copy of it? I printed it, but I have not. So I'll have to do it later to follow along. Okay, great. So I'm going to give everybody another minute or two, and then we'll go through and apply all the new diction rules that, that they learned from this very condensed little hour of learning. And Lynn, I don't know if you saw, but Jason said hello from Oshakon. Oh, okay. Hi, Jason. Oshakon. Hmm. Is that a is that a, a aspect of OSHA? Okay. Did you find at least five mistakes? Very good. Oh, Jason Earl. Oh, from Landmark. Jason, hi. <laughs> How'd you find my, my webinar? <laughs> okay. Let's start from the beginning and just see how well you did. I bet you got at least five. And it's always really a good idea to, to read aloud because you can just hear the mistakes. Once you know those rules, you can hear them a lot better. If the copy machine is experiencing issues, so we just lightly touched on this. I, I, I wouldn't expect you to get this one. We need the verb were because it's conditional. If the copy machine were instead of is, and it can't be experiencing because only a human being can experience something. An inanimate machine cannot experience something. So if the copy machine were what? Malfunctioning, having problems. So instead of experiencing, having problems instead of issues take out the please this is a rule of diction we'll talk about this the next time when you don't need please when it's not part of of your manners you know there's no reason to say it this is an incorrect use of diction not utilize use the one on the second floor 
no exclamation point. See, diction is about tone as well. Why do you need the exclamation point? You know, like, wow, I just won the lottery. Well, you know, well, yeah, second floor, get rid of it. Don't try to fix it. Not and, but don't try to fix it yourself. I think it is wise to let the repair man fix it. We didn't talk about this rule today, but it's the verb. I think with think in there, you don't need the to be verb is. So you would revise that by saying, I think it wise to let the repair man fix it. See, listen, that's very formal, but that's diction. You don't, when you're talking about think, you don't need the is. But if you know the reason why ah, you just bumpered two together, it's a reason or a why, you don't get both. But if you know the reason, it is having an issue. <laughs> please let me know. Another please, er, get rid of that one. An another exclamation point, get rid of that one. So I want to end with, a pet peeve of mine that you can, if you if you commit this, this sin, and you don't have to raise your hand, you don't have to identify yourself, but you're going to never do this one again. And it's the ending that goes thanking you in advance. Folks, diction tells us there's no in advance. It's just thank you. You don't need to add in advance. Okay? Well, it's right at one o'clock. We covered a lot of topics, rules, skills, and I'm always glad that you're here to be spreading the good news of professional, effective technical communication. Thank you. Let's see. How can I obtain the documents presented during this course? Okay, Shane said that he would email them to you. And Lori, Laura said, thank you. You're welcome, Laura. Who else? Anybody else? This is my favorite part, folks. I've been doing all the talking. I like to read what you have to say. Yes. How you're going to apply what you learn. How the hairs on your head are starting to tingle because you're just that critical thinking. Yes. Thank you. This is great. Ah, I love it. Thank you for the great tips. Let's see. Please send a copy as well. If my schedule allows it, I plan to attend the next one. Shane, the next one's in two weeks, correct? It's in two weeks. So June the 25th, mark your calendar. So I'll send out an email just shortly. It'll have a link to our next one. So uh, next, next week, we're having making websites in a snap. So how to do that. And then the following week, Lynn will be back with diction. So uh, we'll do that and we'll email out the handouts again. So if you did not receive the handouts, it should have been attached to the link. But we'll, uh, we'll send that out to you as well. So everyone, thanks so much for attending today. Uh, we absolutely appreciate your attention. Hope that you found it useful. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Okay.